The fur trade impacted the First Nations in many ways after the arrival of Captain Cook and his discovery of the sea otter. During the 25 years that followed his discovery, over 200 ships had come to the native land in search of this profitable fur. Because of this, the amount of time that First Nations spent on seasonal activities had changed, as well as their priorities. To meet the demands of the fur traders, men had to spend more time of their more of their time hunting and trapping, while the women kept busy skinning and preparing the furs, as well as providing for their families. This rush of furs left little time for the First Nations to partake in traditional harvesting and preparation, which created a dependence on the Europeans to supply them with food, tools, and other things. The fur trade also affected First Nations traditional settlement patterns and caused displacement among the aboriginal colonies. The need for furs pushed westward and the demand for furs grew higher as the furs became more scarce. The Cree who lived in the prairies of Canada and worked for the fur traders as guides and hunters pushed west westward with the traders moving into the lands of the Dunza and Denatha. This then caused those tribes to move further west of the Peace River and into Sakani territory, pushing them from the foothills and into the depths of the Rocky Mountains. The, the decline in beaver after the Hudson Bay Company was established in 1670 caused some of the First Nations to expand their territories in an attempt to meet demands. For example, a fur trader named Peter Kinbasket led a group of First Nations beyond the eastern boundaries of their territory to settle in Columbia Valley. The fur traders, the, uh, the fur trade also impacted First Nations quality and use of objects. Instead of spending so much time we've weaving a cedar bark cover, a family could own a factory made woolen blanket. Another thing that made life easier was iron. Iron tools enhanced a carver's work and saved time. Coins and thimbles replaced deer hooves and bird beaks on dancing aprons. These enhanced the status of those who owned them, as well as guns and muskets. The guns ch could change the balance of power between two tribes and change chances of winning a battle dramatically. Because of this, those who owned guns increased their status among their people. Coastal chiefs increased their wealth through trade. In many ways, the fur trade enhanced the life for First Nations, but not entirely. Europeans brought many things to First Nations communities, but they also brought horrid diseases such as smallpox, measles, and influenza. These diseases were foreign to the First Nations, therefore leaving them with little immunity to begin with. It was estimated that approximately 200,000 to 400,000 First Nations inhabited the land when First Nations first arrived. But after the disease epidemics, the population shrunk to 25,000. That's over 90% of the population wiped out. The epidemics came in frightening waves, wiping out towns and villages, leaving families in despair and grieving and struggling to survive. In the worst case occurring in 1782, smallpox swept up from Mexico through the trading routes and into Stolo territory at the mouth of the Fraser River. It left overgrown empty villages and heaps of diseased, dead diseased bodies. In the 1840s, measles took out most of BC First Nations with within a time limit of two years. This epidemic could be traced along the trading routes of the Europeans along the coast and in the interior. The last and worst smallpox ep epidemic passed over most of the province, swallowing First Nations communities. Thousands of First Nations lay dead across the land in piles and in abandoned villages. People were devastated using the, what little energy they had left to cope and survive with the illness and loss.